हेलो ओके कैन यू हियर मी या या ओके सो व्हाट टाइम वी आर स्टार्टिंग स्टार्टिंग ओनली जस्ट वी आर वेटिंग टू मिनट्स ओके श्योर Okay, let's start the session now. Hello, guys. Good morning and welcome, you all. Uh, myself, Archie Dis said, uh, I'm your host for this session. Guys, if you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We will try to help you out. And then talking about our event sponsor, that is Synergetics. So Synergetics is an India one of kind co-porting running solution company. Now you will get a question like who we are and what we're doing. So answering your question, we Bruce Robert offering and also give comprehensive advisory service to clients who wish to modernize their framework. We educate, advise, and implement and manage. Then the Synergetics solution offering that is. Persona based onboarding solution, onboarding add on solution, certification solution, certification add on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre sales training book solution, and architecting solution. Then what this Microsoft certification does, it will give you complete learning experience. You will get trained to build appear for the exam and get certified. This is skilling journey. Here you can advance yourself. First, you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced role based certification and expert level certification. In fundamental certification, we are providing you AZ900, AI900, DP900, PL900, and SC900. In associate level certification, we are providing you many types of certification. Here you can see on my screen. In expert level certification, we are providing you AZ305, SC100, PL600, and AZ400. Also, we have special certification that is uh, AZ120, AZ140, and AZ220. If you want any certification, you can connect with us. So certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. We do provide certification add-on on onboarding add-on like short duration modules and more. Then moving ahead and today training is organized and handled by the ATC community. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology. Under ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all. Then Azure Tech community for Punekas. Emerging technology community for Suratkas, Azure Tech community for Nagpur. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app and you can follow our communities there. Then you have to follow code of conduct, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note that participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. We will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. 
Uh, today's speaker for this training, uh, Sonu Satyadas. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently work with Synergetics as a practice head. Agenda for this webinar, you will get to know more about the topic and benefit of it. Also, guys, we are providing AI 050 complementary learning achievement badge. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated badge. Make sure, guys, you follow us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube for upcoming webinars details. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over this mic our speaker. He will continue. Ahead. OK, thank you, RC. So hi, everyone. I hope I'm audible to all of you. So today's uh, session is all about generative AI. So this is a Microsoft course on specifically on generative AI that contains uh, usually uh, six modules, which uh, talks about the Azure Open AI services. So how we can create and consume the Open AI models in the Azure cloud. Myself, Sonu, and I'm the speaker for today's session. I I'm working with Synergetics from last uh, nine plus years, and I have overall 16 years of experience in training. This session is specifically designed for people who are interested to understand the open AI solutions on the Azure cloud. As I have mentioned, there are six modules. In this course, we are not going to discuss about what is generative AI, what is deep learning models, and what are the different uh, deep learning methods available, or what are the different uh, generative AI models available in the market. To know more about what is generative AI and how to uh, use these generative AI models, you can go to the Microsoft Learn, and there is a fundamental course available for generative AI. I'm sharing the link in the chat to understand what is generative AI, what is responsible AI in generative AI, and what is deep learning, you can go through that fundamentals. In this course, we are primarily talking about how we can create and consume the open AI models with the help of Azure Open AI. So the first module talks about how to deploy the Azure Open AI service, how to create a deployment, and how to consume these uh, models using the uh, Azure Open AI Playground. In the second module, we talk about the natural language uh, solutions or features of generative AI. In module three, we talks about the prompt engineering. And the module four is about generating the code with the help of uh, generative AI models. And also we talk about the image generation model DAL-E. And finally, we will end up the session with the retrieval augmented generation feature, which helps us to bring your own data as a grounding content for the generative AI models for generating 
the domain specific informations. So that's about the course schedule. So without any further delay, let's jump into the first module. The first module is Generative AI Solutions with Azure OpenAI Service. In this, we will be understanding what is generative AI, how to create and deploy the open AI models, and how to use the Azure Open AI Studio. So generative AI is a subset of artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is one of the hot trending technology nowadays. It is not a new technology, but yes, it is there in the industry from last 50 plus years. We have seen different kinds of intelligent systems, expert systems, decision-making solutions. And with the emergence of machine learning solutions, the AI got a different uh, pace and people started building intelligent applications by incorporating different machine learning models. And with the emergence of deep learning models that can be used for very complex data processing, decision makings and predictions like image processing, video processing, or uh, speech synthesis solutions. All these models are developed using the deep learning mod uh, architecture. There are different uh, deep learning architectures available. But all these traditional AI models are pre-trained models, means they are pre-trained with millions of data available in internet. So if you consider the image analysis solutions, natural language solutions, or any speech synthesis solutions, any kind of machine learning or deep learning solutions you see, they are pre-trained with millions of data available in internet. And these models identifies the pattern from the given data and then make some predictions or provide some response by analyzing the given data. But these traditional AI models are not capable to generate anything new. Suppose if you have a machine learning model for making the weather prediction, it can just do the weather prediction based on the input parameters given. But it cannot generates its own data. Or if you go to the image analysis solutions, these image analysis models are trained with uh, millions of images available in internet, and they have learned the patterns from those images. And whenever the user provides an image as an input, it uses its a trained knowledge to identify the patterns from the given image and give the insights about that image. So like uh, what is there inside the image, which color pattern is used, uh, whether it has uh, detected any face, what are the facial expressions identified. All informations can be extracted from the image, but all these are based on the pre-trained knowledge. 
is not going to generate anything new. It will just extract the information from the given data. Suppose if it is an image, from the image, it identifies the object, identifies the faces, identifies the celebrities, identifies the brands. Right, so that is that means it is not generating anything new. But in generative AI model, which is a subset of deep learning solutions, which can create fresh new contents, either as a text data or as image or as uh, audio, which means it is not just providing you the insight about the given data. Instead, it is creating something new. So maybe some of you must have already used the tools like a Copilot or ChatGPT. So as a user, you can just give some instruction or you can request to generate some data. So you can go to the ChatGPT and tell the application to write a story or to write a blog or to write a article. So it is going to create that content for you. It may be an article or a question set or it may be a blog, whatever it is. Or if you are using the image generation models, you can tell the model, can you draw an image of a lion? Then it will give you a image of lion. Means it is drawing an image of lion. It's not going to extract the images from the pre-trained memory and giving you. Instead of that, it is creating, it is drawing an image from the patterns it learned. So every time when you ask the model to generate some content, it is always generating a fresh new content. So that's why these models are called generative AI models. One of the most commonly used or widely used generative AI model is from OpenAI's GPT family. There are hundreds of generative AI models available now in the market. But if you see the open AI model, so open AI is an American research laboratory who creates and distribute the generative AI models. They are public creating and publishing various generative AI models. Some of the models are used for text generation. Some of the models are used for image generation. Some of the models are used for audio generation. So they have different kinds of generative AI models. But if you see, not only the open AI, but also we have other uh, vendors or other communities who create and publish generative AI models. We have models available from Google. We have models available from Meta. And there are many open source models you can find in Hugging Face. But one of the widely used and accepted generative AI model is OpenAI's GPT models, DAL-E models, Whisper models. So OpenAI models can generate the new content, whether it is an image or a text, very accurately so that many organizations now using this generative AI models for building smart AI enabled applications. 
and microsoft is funding for open ai you can say they have partnered with open ai so that these open ai models are now available in the azure cloud platform if you see the open ai models such as gpt models which is that is generative pre trained transformer that is gpt we also have dal e models for image generations we have uh, speech models like uh, tts and uh, whisper so all these models are available in microsoft azure cloud platform also but what is the benefit of consuming the open ai models from the azure platform because we can even directly consume this ai models from the open ai means we can subscribe and consume this open ai models directly from the open ai's website so now the question then why we have to go for azure open ai yes if you see these open ai servers are located in a remote place usually in us locations suppose you are an asian user who wants to consume this open ai models yes you can subscribe and start using this open ai models so when you make a request the request will go from your country to the us location because the execution is always happens in the open ai servers so the problem is there can be a latency for executing this request because all these open ai models are available as rest apis so when you make a rest api request to the open ai servers suppose if you are locating in india from india all the request will go to the us servers and then it execute and send the response back so there can be a latency that's the first thing we have to understand so this will affect the performance of the application secondly these open ai servers are completely managed by the open ai foundation you don't have any option to create or configure these open ai servers which means you don't have control over the network or security configurations but if you comes with or if you use the azure open ai services first of all like other azure services like storage or vms or databases you can deploy your open ai service instances into your preferred location that means suppose if you are from india you can deploy the open ai models in a india location if you are consuming the open ai from australia you can deploy the open ai models in australia so what is the benefit of using that instead of sending the request to a, a remote server which is located in far away like us you can directly send the request to the nearest location because your open ai resources can be deployed in your region suppose if you are a customer from india you can deploy your open ai models in central india or south india and you can start consuming these models so that the request execution is going to happen within india only so that means the latency can be reduced and it will improve the performance of 
the applications. Secondly, when you deploy the Azure Open AI models, you are allowed to configure the network configurations. Suppose if you want to associate the open AI services with a virtual network, means if you want to deploy your open AI resource within a virtual network, you can do that. After that, you can configure your security using firewall or NSG or some other service. So that means you will get control over the network and security configurations. So because of that, organizations prefer to use Azure Open AI because they can directly consume it from the nearest location and they have control over the network and the security configurations. And it also provides built-in monitoring so you can monitor the usage, the request, and other informations using the Azure monitoring service. So a person who has a valid Azure subscription can use the open AI models within using his subscription. But unfortunately, when you create an Azure subscription, the open AI feature is not enabled by default. For enabling the open AI services, you need to submit a request to Microsoft team. For that, you can go to the website that is https colon double slash aka.ms slash OAI apply. So this will give you a registration form or request form. You can fill the details like your subscription ID, your name and other informations and submit a request to Microsoft for enabling the OpenAI models. Once they have identified your subscription is valid and your use cases are considerable, then they will be enabling the open AI services inside your subscription. So make sure that you make the request using your official email ID, not with the personal accounts. Suppose if you have enabled the open AI services, you can start creating the open AI instances like other Azure services like a VMs, storage, database, and network. You can create an instance of the open AI service. For creating this open AI services, you can either use the Azure CLI, that is command line interface, or you can use the web UI interface, that is the Azure portal. If you are a beginner, we always recommend to use the web portal because you can easily create the resources by selecting or providing the input values in the text boxes. Once you have created the open AI resource, you will be able to make deployments. So what is a deployment? Suppose if, if you want to consume the open AI models, such as GPT, DAL-E, Whisper, TTS, embeddings, then you have to deploy an instance of that model. So for that, you have to use the Azure OpenAI Studio. 
the azure open ai studio is a web user interface or is a, a different dashboard or a different uh, website not the azure portal so it's a different website through which you can deploy the models you can see the list of models available in the open ai studio and you can even deploy the models so one very important point you need to understand the availability of these open ai models whether it is gpt 3.5 gpt4 dal e whisper embeddings all these models availability is different in different regions suppose if you want to create something in uh, central india location you have to first make sure that the required service or required model is available in that particular region because all these open ai models are not available in all the countries or all the regions if you look into the documentation you will be able to understand which of the open ai models available in which of the regions so i can take you to the documentation so you can search for the azure open ai models and if you go to the azure open ai models you can see the available models list so you can see gpt4 gpt3.5 embeddings dal e whisper and tts and you can also see the availability of these models and their features So here, this is the GPT-4 and GPT-3.5 availability. You can see every model is not available in every location. Right. And uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo availability, embeddings models availability. This is, and then DAL E models. So DAL E3 is currently available in East US, Australia East, and Sweden Central. Okay. Whisper models are available in these locations so it is very very important to understand which of the models available in which of the locations because if you want to consume the whisper model and you create a resource in central india you will not be able to deploy the whisper model because whisper model is not available in central india you can see so it's available in South India. Okay. So similarly, if you want to use text to speech model, so you can see this, these are available only in these selected locations. So it is very, very important to understand the availability of models in different regions in Azure. So some people will be thinking that all these models are available in all the regions so it's not the case some of the models are commonly available in almost every location but uh, some selected models are available only in specific locations so it's very very important to understand the availability of models before choosing a location Once you have deployed uh, or you have created the open AI resource, 
you can go to the open AI studio and see the list of available models in the selected location or selected region. Suppose if you have created your open AI resources in central India, you will be able to see all the available models in central India. Or if you have created your open AI resource in Southeast Asia, so you'll be able to see all the available resources in Southeast Asia with the help of OpenAI Studio. The OpenAI Studio also allow you to configure fine tuning, configuring the custom data for your models, and even you can test your deployed models using this playgrounds. So there are, uh, usually you will get three playgrounds, completions playground, chat completions playground, and also DAL E playground. So completions playground is usually used to test the legacy models. So if you are deploying the GPT-3 or the older models, then you can use the completions model to test those endpoints. But if you are deploying GPT 3.5 Turbo and the later versions like a GPT-4 or GPT-4 O kind of models, you can use the chat playground. So the chat playground is specifically designed to test the new models. And it also provides a DAL E playground, which can be used to test the DAL E model, which uh, allow you to generate the images. I can show you an example of how to create and deploy the open AI models and how to test this with the open AI studios playground. But before moving to that, first we have to understand what are the common model families available. So what is the difference between model family and model? Model family you can say it's a group of models that share common features or common functionalities. For example, if you consider the GPT-4, which is one of the latest GPT models provided by OpenAI that supports text inputs, image inputs and audio inputs because it accepts different types of inputs we can call it as multi-model model so it's a model that support multiple types of inputs so gpt4 is typically called as multi-model model but in gpt4 itself you will see different versions of GPT. GPT-4 Turbo with a 128K context size, GPT-4 O, which is the latest one, GPT-4 with a vision preview. Like this, there are different versions of GPT-4 available in the GPT-4 family. Similarly, GPT 3.5 is a text only model which is usually used for all the natural language solutions like uh, translations or text generations or uh, conversation chat agent building. So for all the uh, natural language solutions, you can use the GPT 3.5, which is uh, compared to GPT 4. It's a old model, but it is uh, much faster uh, 
uh, than compared to the GPT-4 model. So this GPT-3.5 uh, is also available in various versions, like a GPT-3.5 Turbo, GPT-3.5 Turbo Instruct, GPT-3.5 Turbo 16K, and like this, there are many GPT-3.5 models available. And we also have embeddings model, which is typically used for generating the vector embeddings of the text. So to understand the use of embeddings model, you need to understand how the generative AI models works. So usually these generative AI models operates on numerical data rather than text data. That means they are not directly processing the text data. They uses the vector embeddings. Vector embeddings means it's a numeric representation of the data. So how the text data is represented in a multi-dimensional uh, plane. So that is uh, represented by the embeddings vector. So if you want to convert a text into this numeric format, then you have to use the embeddings model. Suppose if you are planning to build your own custom AI models or custom AI applications with the help of LangChain or Semantic Kernel, then you need the embeddings because the custom AI solutions when you make, you have to bring the data into the AI models but the AI models cannot understand the texture data as it is. So you have to convert this text data into numeric formats. For that, we can use the embeddings. So these embeddings also available in multiple versions that is also available in Azure OpenAI regimes. DAL-E is an image generation model. So DAL-E is available in two versions, DAL-E2 and DAL-E3. And DAL-E3 is uh, highly capable for generating realistic images. Compared to the OpenAI's DAL-E and the Azure OpenAI's DAL-E, so the, the OpenAI's DAL-E, what I say is, the traditional DAL-E model from the open AI. And the DAL-E models, which is available in Azure open AI has some difference because the traditional open AI's DAL-E models supports image generation, image editing, and image variation creations. But, the open AI model, which is uh, open AI DAL E model, which is available in Azure Open AI, is supporting only the image generation. There is no image editing or no variation generation feature available. So, only image generation feature is available in uh, Azure Open AI's DAL E model. To deploy the selected model, you can either use the OpenAI Studio or you can use the Azure CLI. As you see the command here, I'm not explaining this command because it may not be easy for everyone to understand. But if you are using a web UI interface, you just need to select a model and do a deploy. So at that time of deployment, you need to provide a deployment name, which is very, very important. So you can see here, you need to select a model from the first drop down, select a model version, because from this model, there are different versions available. You have to select a version. And also you need to specify the name of the deployment. And you can also see some additional options available which allow you to set the maximum token supported for this uh, request. So per request, 
maximum tokens or the, the based on the duration. So maximum tokens which can be supported can be configured in the advanced options. So what are the different use cases of uh, the GPT models? If you see, we use uh, we usually makes request to this generative AI models using prompt. So what is a prompt? A prompt is a text input that we provide to the models. So whether it is the DALI model or GPT model, we provide text input and we, that means it's simply a command or instruction which we can provide to the GPT model. For example, if I have to translate a text from English to Spanish, so I can give a text instruction to the model such as convert the below text into Spanish, and then you can provide your text so that will your model will understand what the user is expecting from the given input text. That is, that input text is called a prompt. And once the model executes the request, it generates a result, and that result text is typically called as completion. So completion means the response generated by the open AI models. And the prompt means the input text you are providing to the model. So here you can see some examples or use cases of uh, GPT uh, models you, that uses prompt and completions. For example, for classifying the content, so you can specify that there is a tweet like I enjoyed the training course. Now below you can specify sentiment. So it will identify from this prompt that he has given a tweet and I have to identify whether this tweet is a positive or negative or neutral. That means I have to identify the sentiments. Considering the second example, generate a new content. So we are we can give a prompt, some, something like a, write a poem about databases or write a story about monkeys or write a blog uh, regarding the uh, Angular and React. So like this, you can give text inputs. So we can use it for transformation and translation. So if you want to convert your text from one language to another language, you can request the model to convert the text. Summarization. What is summarization? Suppose if you have a very lengthy paragraph, maybe four or five lengthy paragraphs you will have, maybe like articles, and you want to extract the key uh, statements and summarize it in a short paragraph. Suppose if you have three to four paragraphs related to a particular topic, you can tell the model, okay, I don't have time to read all this. Just give, give me a summary of this text. So it, the model will take that text and then summarize it in just a few lines of text. Continuation is another feature which we can do with this GPT models. Like uh, if you are, if you want to write a story, you can start writing the story. After writing the first few words, then you can make a request to complete the story. Like uh, once upon a time, there was a king. And then you can tell the model, complete this remaining story. So it will take your input. The beginning of the text is taken as an input and it will generate the remaining story for you. 
question and answering. So you can use it as a typical, uh, what, what to say, uh, agent that can provide answers to your questions. So you can ask any questions that model. So it will be answering from the pre-trained knowledge. For example, you can ask, so uh, how many moons does Earth have? Or who is the president of America? But like this, you can ask your questions and it will give you the answer for that. And one of the most commonly used scenario or commonly uh, uh, used approach is using the GPT models for chat applications. Suppose if you are building a virtual assistant like a chat box, you can use generative AI to generate the responses of that AI assistant. So that means whenever the user makes a query into the chat assistant, that chat bot is going to generate and return the responses with the help of generative AI models. As I have mentioned, if you have created and deployed the open uh, AI models, you can test these models in OpenAI Studio itself with the help of playgrounds. Playgrounds can be a chat playground, completions playground, or the DAL E playground. So I'll show you an example how we can create the open AI model and test these models with playground. So for that, first of all, we have to log in to the Azure portal. And make sure that your subscription has open AI enabled. And now, in my case, in my subscription, the open AI is already enabled. So I'm going to deploy an open AI resource. So I can search for open AI. And here you can see the Azure open AI. So let's create an Azure OpenAI instance. Yes, you can select your subscription. So which subscription is having the OpenAI enabled? Select that subscription and select a resource group. So I already have an, a resource group called OAI group. I already have a deployment, but I'm going to deploy once again. So I'm selecting this resource group and region. So region is very, very important because I have already mentioned that the availability of these models, uh, OpenAI models depends uh, on the region. It may vary. So if you select East US, most of the services will be available. Or if you select Sweden Central, most of the models will be available. But if you select locations like a Central India, South India, not all these models available there. So for that, you need to refer the documentation and it's keep updating. So they are keep updating the list of regions. So before doing any deployments, verify the uh, documentation to get the updated list of regions. So in my case, I'm going with Sweden Central because Sweden Central is the location which offers most number of models. Now I can provide a name for the instance. So I can provide a name as Synergetics hyphen open AI. And then I can specify the pricing tier. 
Now, when you click on next, you can configure the networking. So if you want to deploy the open AI behind the VNet, means you want to allow access only from the VNet resources, you can you go with the selected networks option. But in my case, I don't want to restrict or I don't want to uh, implement any kind of restriction for networking. So I want to allow connection from all networks. That's a default option. And I'm going ahead with that. Tags, if you want, you can provide. Otherwise, just create. You can see the deployment is happening. It may take a minute to complete the deployment. You can see the deployment is completed. So this is your open AI resource. And inside this resource, you can see the key and endpoint. So this key and endpoint is similar to other a uh, Azure services, whether you go with the storage account or key vault or any service you go, you can see uh, keys. So keys are typically used for the authentication purpose. So from your applications, if you want to connect to the open AI resources, you will be able to use this key one or key two. So there are two keys provided and this endpoint is used to connect or used to make request to your open air resources. That means as a user, when you make a REST API request uh, to your open AI model, you are actually sending the request to this particular endpoint. And this endpoint is in this particular region. So that means you can choose the location you like and then make a request to that location. So this endpoint is actually pointing to this region. So currently we are going to try the model deployments. So either I can go with this model deployments and from here I can go to manage deployments. So that means it uh, needs to go or it will open the Azure OpenAI Studio. We can see it's opening the Azure Open AI Studio. Or if you don't want to go with this model deployments, you can see in the overview page itself. If you go to the overview page, at top you will see a link for go to Open AI Studio. So this also you can use. So I can use this link to open the OpenAI Studio. So here is the OpenAI Studio portal. You will be able to see two sections in the left side, that is playground and the management. Management contains different options for uh, creating and listing the deployments and models is for viewing the list of models. 
and we can also configure the content filter data files and the quota for this resources and the playground section is typically used to test your deployed models using chat playground completions playground and the dal e playground so if i go to the deployments you can see currently there is no deployments available, which means I have not deployed any open AI models yet. So what I can do, I'll go to the model section. Here I can see the complete list of available models in this region. So if you go to US or South India or Central India, the list of models will be different, means maybe less number of models you can see there. So here you can see the Whisper, TTS, Embeddings, GPT-4, GPT-3.5, DAL-E. Every model is available here. So I would like to deploy two models here. One is GPT-3.5 Turbo Instruct and another one is GPT-35, that is 3.5 Turbo 16K. So these are the two models I like to deploy now. So first I'm going to select GPT-35 Turbo Instruct. I'll tell you why I'm selecting two GPT models. So first of all, let me deploy this. So I'm selecting this model, click on this deploy button, and here you can see the selected model. So you can even select from here also, this drop down. And you can leave the other values as it is. If you want to automatically update to the latest, then you can select auto update to default, or else you can select a fixed version. Okay, and deployment type is standard only, and deployment name you can specify. So, because for uh, understanding which is the model I'm deploying, I'm just giving the model name it as the deployment name so since the model name and the deployment name is matching so i can easily understand which is the model deployed so here in the advanced sections you can configure the content filter that means for moderations uh, for example if you are using some self harm violence sex contents in, uh, inside the text so it will automatically moderate. OK, so there is a default moderator applied. If you want, you can create your own custom moderator and configure the severity level for the uh, contents. Tokens per minute late rate limiting. So per minute, how many tokens we, we want to use? Suppose here you can see 120K is the max. You can set it to, suppose I want to use only 5K, means 5,000 tokens per minute. So what is this token? So usually when you provide a text input or when the model is generating a text response, it is calculating the amount of data which is processed is based on tokens. So usually the text, inside the text, every word is represented as a token. So sometimes if it is a larger word, then it may be divided into two tokens or three tokens. For example, if I have a prompt, means input, with the 10 words inside it, so I can usually calculate it is approximately at 10 tokens used. But if I'm using very lengthy words, then it may uh, show that there are 15 or 20 tokens used, but the actual number of words will be 10. Because each word is bigger, it will be divided into two or three pieces. So that we don't need to worry about that. It will automatically do the token creation. But how many tokens we can use in a minute because here the cost is calculated 
based on the number of tokens consumed. OK, so it is very important to restrict the number of tokens supported to avoid unnecessary uh, cost. So I'll go with all the default values. Click OK. Now you can see successfully deployed. OK, so if you go to the deployment section, you can see now there is a deployment name that is GPT-35 Turbo Instruct, which is using the model GPT-35 Turbo Instruct. If I want to deploy one more model, I can go back to the model section and then select the next model and deploy or else from here itself you can select create new deployment if I select. You will get the same drop down, but there is no value selected here. So you have to manually select it. Suppose I'm selecting GPT 35 Turbo 16K. And for easy understanding, I'm going to give the same name for the deployment also. Number of tokens which can be consumed, I can change to 5K. Okay, so the total number of tokens or maximum number of tokens which is supported per model is varied, depends on model. So if you see, this is supporting 180K tokens. Okay, so that you can, you can see it is, because the context size and the capacity of the models varies depends on the version. OK, so. Don't confuse. Now I can see there are two deployments. One is the Turbo Instruct and another one is the. Turbo 16K. Now I can go to the chat. Playground. So this is the chat playground. And here. You will see three sections in your playground. One is the setup. Second is the chat panel and the third one is the configuration. So if you see in the configuration, you can select a deployment here. So which model you want to try? Suppose if I want to try the GPT-35 Turbo 16K, I can select that model. And also you can specify the number of tokens which can be consumed in this request. In the parameters, you can see something like a temperature and top piece, top stop sequence, etc. So this temperature is typically used to uh, specify the uh, it's a value between zero and one, and it is usually used to denote the creativeness and, or uh, creativity or randomness of your response. So if you want your model to be more creative and more innovative, then you have to select one or near to one. But if you set it to zero, then your model will always generate the similar answers for most of the time. Means the same question you ask, every time the same answer will be generated. Here you can configure the max response tokens. Okay, so that means when the response is generated, maximum response that can be used in the response. So this is very helpful to control the cost because the cost is calculated based on the number of tokens. OK. Suppose if I have to try. A request, so here. I can ask a question. Suppose if I simply say hi. See, it's giving how can I assist you today? Help me with the latest uh, information about Python. 
I'm just giving, I don't know what information to generate. So you can see it is generating some information. So you can see Python 3.9 is the latest stable version uh, of according to October 2020, right? So because these models are pre-trained models, their data is not up to date, okay? Because these models are trained with the data which is available to a specific period, okay? So if you ask, okay, what happened in the uh, T20 World Cup yesterday, it cannot answer, okay? It's not a news search engine. Okay, so this is generating the answers based on the pre-trained knowledge. Okay, so if you ask the model what happened yesterday in T20 World Cup, it cannot give you an answer because it is not trained with that. But yes, it is possible to bring that new updated data also, but that we will discuss later. So. A as you can see, it is generating the response, but this response is not up to date. So I can also ask, create a Python code to uh, perform binary searching. So you can see it is writing the code for me. So like this, you can ask the model to do something and the model will be responding. Okay. And here you can see how much tokens consumed. So 834 out of uh, 16,000 tokens to be sent. So including the a request and response total this many tokens used. But if you see there are two more playgrounds, one is completions playground and another one is DAL E playground. So what is that uh, completions playground? I will explain later. Okay. And DAL E, we have a separate module on DAL E. So we will talk about the DAL E models later. Okay. So this is what uh, in the first module. In the first module, we have seen how we can create and deploy the open AI models in Azure and what is the benefit of deploying with Azure and how to deploy the models, various versions of models, how we can deploy and how to test them with the help of playground. So now if you have any questions, you can put that questions in the chat. I'll try to answer it. So we will take a small break also. After the break, we will continue to, with the second module. So it, it will be a 10 to 15 minutes break and we will be continuing with the second module after the break. So if you have any questions on the points discussed, you can put the questions here. Okay, so let's go for the break.
Hello everyone. I hope all are back. So I didn't see any questions. So let's move to the next module. In this module, we are trying to understand the natural language capabilities of the Azure OpenAI service. We'll see how to integrate the OpenAI within your applications and how to consume the OpenAI resources using REST APIs and how to use the language specific SDK. To use the open AI services within your applications, first of all, you need to understand what are the different endpoints available for consuming this model functionalities. So when you talk about the GPT models, that is generative pre-trained transformer models, which is primarily used for text generations or text uh, related data generations. There are three common endpoints we use. One is a completion endpoint. Second one is embeddings endpoint. And the third one is chat completion endpoint. Completion endpoint, which is used to generate the text, a uh, completion text, and it accept a string as an argument. So it means an input string is ac accepted as an argument and it is generating the completions. So one or more responses can be generated. For example, if you ask the user to, or sorry, if you ask the model to generate a story, you just need to give an instruction. Can you generate a story of a monkey or a king or whatever you like? So the model is going to generate the response for that. So why it is called completion endpoint? Because you are providing an input text, which may be a starting point of your completion. Based on that, it generates the remaining data. For example, if you are a programmer who works with SQL queries, you can specify select star from. So the rest of the SQL data it will generate because it understood what we are trying to generate. So we are trying to execute the select query. So select star from and it will write the remaining code or if i am writing a story i can start writing something like a once upon a time there was a king and then it generates the remaining text so that means it is just a provide you the response text by looking into the input text so it can be a question it can be a story uh, or it can be some other kind of content so it depends on the input uh, content or input text which is called a prompt it generates the responses embeddings as i have mentioned earlier the models are not dealing with the data direct uh, dealing with the text data directly so they always use the numeric representation of your data that is called a vector embeddings representation or vector embeddings data. So if I have to make a search request or if I have to generate the responses using a GPT model, we have to convert the text into numeric data. So when you build the AI applications, we do need to do this manually. You just need to use the embeddings model object. It will do the things for you automatically. But 
Yes, an embeddings model is required to generate the vector representation of the text. Chat completion endpoints are similar to completion endpoints, but the difference is in chat completion endpoints or for chat completion endpoints, we need to provide the prompt in the form of a chat conversation, not as a simple text. So in completion endpoints, we just provide a text like a uh, can you write a story for me or uh, can you translate the text from uh, this language to this language like this simple text we can provide as a input for the completion endpoints but in chat completions you need to specify the input in the form of a chat conversation so there are many benefits of using that format that we will discuss in the prompt engineering section. So completion and chat completion both can be used to generate the response, but the difference is chat completion is expecting the request to be in a chat conversation format and it uh, returns the response as a conversational AI response. If you see, <coughs> If you see the completion and embeddings endpoints are legacy uh, endpoints or they are only available with the legacy models. So we are not going to discuss about those endpoints in this uh, session. So this is the session we we'll talk about only chat completion because chat completion endpoint is the uh, endpoint that is supported by all the uh, modern GPT models like a GPT 3.5 Turbo, GPT 4.0 and all the other models. So completion and embeddings are used with the older models. Here you can see the REST API endpoint for completions if you look at if you look at this url the url is starting with the base address of your open ai resource so if you go to the open ai's e and endpoint section you can see the endpoint so this is the open ai endpoint uh, address so you can see this open ai endpoint address is coming here as the base address right so here you will be able to see this right after that you need to specify slash open ai slash deployments slash deployment name so here in this position you need to specify the name of the deployment. So in our case, you can see we have done two deployments. If I go to deployments, so here, okay, the DAL E is auto generated because we have opened the DAL E playground. So it will automatically create the DAL E. So if you see, these are the two models, uh, GPT models I have created. So one is, GPT 3.5 Turbo Instruct and another one is GPT 35 Turbo 16K. So that is the model name and the same is used as the deployment name. So what is the name of the deployment that you have to specify here? Slash completion. So if it is slash completions, which means you are invoking the completions endpoint, which means you just need to provide a text as an input and it returns the response. See how the request is created. Prompt equal to or prompt colon. Your favorite Shakespeare play is, which means I'm giving the starting point of the text and the balance of this text is completed by the model or who is going to give the completion response? 
that is done by the AI model. So you can provide some additional parameters in the request, like a max tokens stolen five, which means in the response maximum how many tokens it can use. So one token means uh, four or five characters or three to four, five characters max. So five tokens means five into four, around 20, like 20 to 25 characters uh, I can use maximum. So that means the response need to be generated in maximum 20 characters. OK, not more than that. So you can see when the response is generated, you can see the right side of the response. This is the response object. The response object contains choices as an array because multiple responses may be generated. OK, but in this case, only one response. But, but there, there are possibilities where you can see multiple responses. So choices of zero, that is the first object, dot text. So the text attribute contains the response. So here you can see Macbeth. So you can fill the text as your favorite Shakespeare play is Macbeth. OK, so that will be the completed response. But if you come to embeddings, you can see it is again using the same open AI endpoint slash open AI slash deployment slash deployment name. So this time you have to specify the deployment of embeddings model. So here we don't have any embeddings model. So this is DALI and this is G these two are GPT. Suppose if I have to use embeddings, then you can create a new deployment. From here, text embeddings model you can select. So I'm selecting text embeddings ADA002. I'm giving the same as the same name for the deployment also. Model name and deployment name now look similar and create. So here you can see the text embeddings ADA is deployed. So when you make a request, okay, when you make a request in the deployment section, it is uh, required to fill the embeddings model name. Then you can specify slash embeddings, which says that you are making request to the embeddings endpoint. And in the request body, you need to specify only the input text. You can say the food was delicious and the waiter was very friendly. So this is the text input we are providing, but it generates a response. You can see the response object contains a data array inside the data you will see the embeddings array so embeddings array is actually a set of numeric uh, information you can see but when it comes to chat completions endpoint again it is similar to the completions endpoint you need to specify the base URL slash open AI slash deployment slash name of the deployment slash chat slash completions. Then here you can see the request body. The request body is containing an array of messages because here in the chat completions, we need to send the request in the form of a chat conversation. So here, you can see in this case you will see every message is having two attributes one is a role and the second one is a content right so every message object has having two attributes role and content so one message will contain one role and one content. 
Okay, so this is another message. This one. And this is another message. And this is the last message. So you can see there are four messages inside the messages array. And every message will have a role and a content section. The role, if you look, there is a system role you can see, user role you can see, and an assistant role you can see, right? So what is system is? System is used to set the system message. System role is used to set the system message. So what is the importance of system message is? It is used to set the behavior of the AI assistant. So that means whenever you make a request to the AI model, how the model is going to behave, that nature of the model we can configure at using the system message. So here you can see you are an assistant that teaches people about AI. That means we are setting a system message that will instruct the model that it has to behave like a teacher or it has to behave like an assistant who can teach the people uh, about the artificial intelligence. So in every conversation, system message will be the first message because that is used to configure the nature of the assistant. Now you can see there can be a conversational history included. Conversation history means the user is asking one question and the assistant means the AI assistant is responding. Again, the user is asking second question, then assistant is responding like a question and answer, like a user is asking something, there is a response. So that is called conversation. So here, after the system message, you can see there is a conversation included. So this is completely a conversation, right? So there's the conversation we can see, which you can see role equal to user and the user content means the user is asking, does Azure OpenAI support multiple languages? So that's a prompt question and the role equal to assistant, which means the assistant is responding saying, yes, Azure OpenAI support several languages. Now this is next question we are, the user is asking, a role equal to user, that means user is asking the next question, that content equal to, do other cognitive services support translation? Then the answer has to come from where assistant. But you can see inside the messages why we are including this user and assistant conversation. Instead of that, can we directly put this one? Yes, it is possible. But what is the importance of adding this type of conversations in the prompt is, first of all, the assistant will be aware what is the conversation context now? Means what we are talking about now. So it will get an idea. Okay, we are talking about this. From the history, it will understand. Okay, we are talking about some Azure services, something like that. Okay. Second benefit is it will help the AI assistant to generate the answers in a particular format. So by looking into the previous conversations, it will try to generate the few, means the upcoming answers. So any questions, uh, any questions which is asked by the user will be answered in the similar way based on the examples which is given. So here you can see it is user is asking a question and it is answering as a yes or no question, right? Similarly. The next question, 
do other cognitive services support translation, which is also answered in the same way. Here you can see the response contains choices, choices of zero dot message, and the message of zero will contain what, or the message is containing what? One, a role that is assistant, and the content that is the actual response, right? So answer is yes, other cognitive service also support translation. So that means it is understanding whenever the user asks a question, I'm supposed to answer just like a yes or no question. So yes or no, and then the description of that. So from this conversation, it is understanding what is the format I have to follow for answering the questions. So that is the benefit of including the conversation history or messages inside of the prompt. But if you ask me if I'm not providing any such examples, so this is an example. So if I'm not including such example, will it work? Yes, it will work. OK, I'll show you an example. If I can go to the open AI's playground. Let me clear. So what we have discussed is first setting up a message. So here a system message. So you can see and in the setup section, we can select a predefined message format. OK, or you can create your own message. So this is the default message, which just says you are an assistant that help people to find information. But if you want to change, you can do that. For example, you are a teacher uh, who helps students to understand the problems step by step. OK, so I'm just giving a message. So whatever is the message you want, you can set. But I'm just setting this message. After setting this system message, now I am asking how to perform binary searching or binary search. So I'm asking a question. So you can see it is giving an answer just like a teacher, how the teacher is explaining the uh, answer that this is the first step, then do this, then do this like that. It is explaining step by step. But if I change my system message and then using the same prompt, see what's the difference comes. You are a Python programmer helps developers to write code. Okay, so write code and I'm setting this as the system message. Now what happens if I use the same prompt? So I'm copying the same prompt and trying to put this. So now the new chat session is started. I'm putting the same. See, this time it is not only giving the steps, but also providing the Python code for binary search. Look at that same question I have asked because the nature of the assistant is different. It gives or it answers in different way, right? So that means if it is a teacher, it's just explaining the steps to the students, like in a simple way it was explaining. But when it becomes a Python programmer, it uh, writes the Python code for that. OK, so that is the importance of system message. Suppose if you want to include some examples, you can add examples here like a conversation history. So here a user prompt and here assistant response. So multiple examples you can include that we will see in the later sessions.
And here we can configure the deployment model. So I have two GPT models. I can select the GPT Turbo 16K, which is the latest model that support the chat completions endpoint. But if you go to the completions endpoint, so here in the completions endpoint, here you can see only one model. So why it is not showing both the GPT models? There is a GPT-35 Turbo 16K is also available, but it is not showing here. The reason completions endpoint or completions uh, API is not supported in new models. Because here in one of the slide we have seen the completion endpoint is available in older models. In GPT-35 Turbo Instruct is actually a new model, but it is supporting the completion endpoint because, for, because of the backward compatibility. Because if you already have some applications which is uh, using the completion endpoint, so you can continue for using that with the help of Turbo Instruct. But if any new applications you make, it is always recommended to use the uh, Chat Completions API. So let's see how the Completions Playground is working. So here you can see it is not like a chat conversation, just an input text. For example, once upon a time, there was a cruel king ruled. And then I'm just generating the response. You can see this is my starting text and the rest of the steps it generates. You can see it is generated up to this, but it is not able to complete the story because I have clearly mentioned maximum how many tokens I can use in the re response. So here you can see max length tokens is 100. And I have used 100 tokens maximum. So if in 100 token, it is difficult to complete the story. So if I increase this to maybe 500, and then you can just... Uh, remove this and i'm regenerating this it's it's not updated yeah it's generating it's taking some time but you can see so it is generating more content right compared to the previous one because the number of tokens which is supported uh, for the response is 500. So we we'll try to generate a story in 500 uh, tokens. So I can delete and regenerate. It will generate a new story. OK, so every time it is going to generate some new story because it is generative AI model. OK, so that's the difference between the completions endpoint and the chat completions endpoint. So using the Azure Open AI SDK. So if you are a programmer, you can integrate these Open AI models within your applications using this SDK. Yes, it is possible for you to make request using REST API, but making a request using REST API may not be a, a good approach or may, may not be easy for every developer because every developer may not be aware about how to make HTTP requests from the applications. But they are able to uh, invoke functions using the objects. So if you use the OpenAI SDK, you can install the OpenAI library 
in inside your application and you can create an open ai client and then just make a request to the open ai's model so how you can see we have to import this is the c sharp example so you can see the python example also but here in this it is a c sharp one so you can see we are importing the open ai's namespace just like java also java also you can use it but since it's a microsoft course they are providing samples only for c sharp and python so we are creating the open ai client object using the uri that is the endpoint and the authentication key that is the key and endpoint is used to create the open ai client and then we have to make a request to the chat completions endpoint so for that we need to configure the messaging structure so for that we need to create an object of chat completion options so chat completion options options equal to new chat completion options then create a list of messages so if you want to include example messages you can do otherwise only system message and the prompt is enough so the first message is always the system message you can see new chat message of chat role dot system and then this the system message and second message is another chat message and you can specify chat role dot user and what is the user prompt that you can provide so there are two messages inside this messages list you can also specify the max tokens that means how many tokens we have to use for generating the response temperature that means the creativity of the responses and obviously the deployment name so deployment name means you have just mentioned the endpoint and the key but there can be multiple gpt models deployed right so if you consider the example this example here you can see multiple gpt models deployed but you are making request to which which gpt model so that deployment's name you have to specify inside your request so that you have to specify here And then make a request using client dot get chat completions, and then specify the options, and you will get the response. Response dot choices of zero dot message dot content, and then print that completion message. Okay. The same thing we can do using Python also, but in Python we have to import the open Azure Open AI. Uh, in uh, class and then create an instance of Azure OpenAI. So client equal to Azure OpenAI. Then you will be specifying the endpoint authentication key and the API version, which is not required in C sharp, but in Python we need to specify the API version. And then make a request directly. You can make a request including the messages. So client dot chat dot completions dot create which means we are making a chat completions request and what is a model model means what is the name of the deployment what is the temperature value what is the max number of tokens and the array of messages you can see this is the array of messages so there is a system message and a uh, user message so the message is in the JSON structure. Can you see role equal to system and then content equal to content? Once the response is generated here in this variable, we can print that response response dot choices of zero dot message dot content. Okay. So that is uh, how we use the open AI within our 
applications. So that's the end of the, the second module. Now, if you have any questions on the second module, please put that in the chat window. I'll be answering to that. OK, Saravana has asked the questions. Embeddings cannot be used with the modern or latest models. See, embeddings was previously a part of GPT models, the older GPT models. But now for embeddings, there are dedicated models available. So not with the GPT. So if, if you see, we have a separate embeddings model available. So you can use this. So it's not part of GPT anymore. It's a separate model. So text embeddings ADA. It's actually a GPT based model only, but it's now available in a different name. So you can use this text embeddings models. OK, so that uh, is keep updating. So I think they are they have released the version three also. So they are keep updating this embeddings model also. Do we have prompt engineering jobs separately? How to find resources to master the skills? And any additional support to be prompt engineering? Yeah, so this uh, prompt engineering is a technique or it's a kind of best practices that we can use to build a, a better prompt. So we will see in our next module what are the different uh, options we have for creating better prompt. So that we'll see in our upcoming module. So now we have completed two modules. In this third module, we are going to talk about prompt engineering. So here we will see what are the best practices for building a prompt for generating accurate and relevant results. So this module talks about what is prompt engineering and review considerations for different endpoints and explore different techniques of prompt engineering. So let's first understand what is prompt engineering. So prompt engineering is a technique for building effective prompt. Because when you provide a text input as a prompt, it the model may not be able to generate your generate the responses that you are expecting because we all are familiar with google search engine we just go to the google and provide only the search keyword or maybe a small word or a small sentence for google searching this is enough because it just go and do a text similarity search and just provide you the matching web page results. So for web page searching, providing a simple keyword or a simple sentence is fine. But for generative AI models, you have to provide the effective prompt. What it means is, Suppose if you are expecting a result in a particular format, particular style, particular structure, but you just provide a very less input, the model will understand only that much. It cannot do anything on its own. So what is the input you have provided? It is going to generate a response only based on that. If you are expecting your answers to be formatted, structured in a particular way, then you have to clearly mention that inside your 
prompt and there are different approaches maybe for generating the responses you need to provide some additional informations or maybe you have to generate your answers based on a particular text content so all you need to provide to the model then only the model will be able to generate it accurately okay so you cannot expect the model will do everything you just need to provide a single uh, keyword or single uh, statement as an instruction no prompt engineering is talking about what are the different ways we can uh, provide or we can uh, create prompts what are the prompt components that can generate accurate and relevant results so we are constructing prompts to maximize the relevancy and accuracy of completion so why we are doing prompt engineering and why we are providing prompts because we have to increase the relevancy or, and accuracy of the completions it means whenever the response comes it has to satisfy the user requirements we can specify formatting and style of completions so we can say okay the result has to come in this particular format particular structure provide conversational context yes inside the prompt we can provide the context information okay i want to uh, generate my responses based on this information so what is that information you have to provide okay and it also helps to mitigate bias and improve fairness because if you clearly mention what you are expecting so it will be able to generate the fair answers. I can give you an example right away. Suppose if I want to generate a set of questions, I can use the chat GPT. So all of you will be familiar with the chat GPT. So you can see I'm going to chat GPT and see what my expectation is, I want to create some React questions. Because I'm going to conduct a batch on React for the lateral people, okay, experienced people. They are already familiar with the basic fundamental concepts. And I am expecting to conduct a two or three day session. And after the session, I want to do an assessment so for generating the assessment questions i need to uh, generate i need that uh, to conduct that assessment i need to generate uh, maybe 10 to 15 or 20 mcq questions so here i'm just limiting to 10 because 20 will be very lengthy so i want to generate 10 questions on react and i have clearly mentioned I'm going to conduct the batch for the laterals who are already experienced in a React or basic JavaScript frameworks. So it's not for freshers. So suppose if I'm, my intention is to generate the question. Suppose if I go and provide a prompt, just like a create 10 MCQ questions on React. This is my prompt. See, it is generating the question and the answer. You can see it's generating the questions. Right, so 10 questions. But when I see this, I can understand that this one, uh, this question is very, very basic. See, first of all, it is, first question is what is, the primary purpose of react i have already mentioned i am going to take this batch for the laterals not for the freshers so they are already aware what is react what is the difference between react and other frameworks so i am i am taking i am trying to take some advanced concepts in react not the very basic functionalities because these people are already aware about react so these kind of basic questions i don't want to 
include. OK, so which method is used to create the component? OK, so that kind of basic questions I don't want to include. So now I can modify this prompt to specify that. OK, so I'm saying create 10 MCQ questions. And also you can see here it is providing the answer, but it's not giving the explanation why this answer is correct. So I am expecting the explanation of the answer also because when I conduct the assessment, if the participant is asking, so sir, why this is correct? Why this answer is correct? So I, I need to answer that. So I can ask the chat GPT to include the explanations also. So I can say create 10 MCQ questions on React with the answers and the, its the explanations. Then I can say. Then I can say. Include. Questions from the advanced topics. Such as. Context, I'm just saying some topics name only context API or Redux. Redux toolkit. Then maybe higher order components. Or maybe progressive web apps. Then OK. Etc. I'm just including some topics names. So these are some of the advanced topics that I want to include. So now when I generate this question, you can see it is generating the question. So it's directly starting with the context API. It's not using what is React or what is the benefit of React. That kind of simple questions it ignore. And you can see it is providing the question then the answer and the explanation for that answer. And you can see these are the different uh, questions, right? So reducer and all these things. So higher order components included, progressive web apps included, all the, the advanced features include. So whatever topics I have mentioned, okay, I have told, okay, include questions from this, this topic, then it is generating questions from that. But now I have realized, OK, I have generated the questions, but these all questions looks like. Me me medium type questions or easy questions or difficult questions, but I want to conduct an assessment like uh, if there are 10 questions, I want to conduct the assessment in such a way that there are three easy questions. Three, uh, sorry, four medium level questions and uh, three hard level questions. So how I can generate the questions in such a way? Because this this is OK. This is OK for generating uh, or conducting the assessment. But my expectation is there are three easy questions, four medium level questions and three hard level questions. So that is a format I want. So inside this prompt, I have to clearly mention what format I'm expecting. So create questions or create a three easy questions for medium level questions and three hard level questions. Now if I generate this, you can see it is generating easy questions. How many three easy questions it is generate? Then medium level questions it is generating. Four medium level questions it generates. And then it is generating three hard level questions. Okay. So how accurate it is or a, that I don't know, but this is AI, artificial intelligence. So it uses its own knowledge to 
find out what is hard, what is easy and what is medium. But yes, you can see this is the format I'm expecting. See, from the beginning, I, I it was generating the questions correctly or it was generating the questions properly. But the expected response is different. So I was expecting some advanced level of questions and that itself it to be divided into three categories, easy, medium and the hard. So when I provided a prompt, OK, so my instruction is only this much. Create a uh, MCQ, M 10 MCQ questions in React. This was my instruction. But some additional information what I have provided is provide answers with the explanation. Then I am providing the supporting content that is include questions from these these topics so instead of generating the question from any topic i have clearly mentioned okay include the questions from these this topic so this is the supporting content or supporting instruction i am providing and here i have clearly mentioned the format i need the questions in such a format like there are three easy four medium and three hard questions Right. So now when I given this prompt, it is generating the answers in an expected format. So that is what we are going to see here. So considerations for API endpoints. So if you are using completions API, that means the older API uh, for generating the responses, you need to provide the uh, prompt directly inside the request body. So prompt equal to whatever is the prompt. So complete the uh, context, instruction, supporting instruction, everything you have to provide within the prompt itself. So when you use chat completions, we have different options for including the or uh, using the prompt engineering techniques because we have the system message which can be used to specify the behavior of the assistant. We have uh, options for including the examples because while including the examples, it helps the model to understand what, what we are talking about and how to generate the answer. The format and the context information will be available to model. So, uh, in different API endpoints, the prompt engineering techniques will be different because in completions API, you can directly include every instruction directly in the prompt, but in chat completions, you have to configure it with the help of system message, with the help of examples, with the help of grounding content and many other options. So that is what we are going to see. The first best practice for Prompt engineering is providing clear instructions. So you can see we have to, this is an example. So we have to generate a product description for a new water bottle. So we have a water bottle and we want to generate a product description for them. So if I'm giving a very simple prompt, just saying, okay, write a product description for the water bottle. So it create the description but how relevant is that that is a question because my water bottle is having lots of features because it is uh, 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 maybe made with a biodegradable plastic or maybe it is uh, 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 reusable or it may be uh, uh, not using any kind of colors or anything so that that informations are not included in the response because the model is understanding from the prompt okay it need a product description about a water bottle so whatever it knows about water bottle general information it just include that and create a description but if you want to include all the relevant informations in the description you have to clearly include that informations in the prompt so see in the right side how they have modified the prompt and how the completion is different. Write a product description for a new water bottle that is 100% recycled. 
be sure to include that it comes with a natural colors with a no dyes and the each purchase remove 10 pounds of plastic from our oceans. That means we are telling the model, OK, these are the points you have to include in the product description. So see in the when when the completion is generated, the second one is more relevant and accurate because that is clearly defining the benefits of using this water bottle. Right, so that is the importance of providing clear instruction. So in my example also, I have showed you what is the benefit of writing clear instructions in the prompt. Now, if I have to uh, write some prompt or clear prompt with some uh, context specific informations, we need to understand what are the things I can include inside the prompt. So there are section markers we can include. So section marker can be three hyphens or three hash symbols, which is used to separate the uh, uh, elements or contents within this prompt. For example, I have to summarize it, summarize a paragraph. So first I will give the paragraph and then below I will give the instruction OK. Uh, summarize the above paragraph. So which is the instruction and which is the uh, grounding content or the uh, main primary content? So how to separate it using the section marker? So you can say provide the primary content, which is the paragraph that you want to summarize and then uh, give se a section marker that is a separator and then below the instruction. So the instruction is separated from the primary content using the section marker. Or if you are including the examples and uh, instruction, so examples and the instruction can be separated using section marker. Okay, so section marker will help you to separate the different elements, maybe example and the instruction, example and the primary content or primary content and the instructions all can be separated using this three hyphens. So there can be primary content that need to be summarized or translated. For example, I am saying, OK, uh, this is the paragraph and below the instruction like a summarize the above paragraph. So the above mentioned paragraph is the primary content. Because that I want to process that data or I'm giving an English text and then below I'm giving the instruction translate this to Spanish or translate this to French. So the above mentioned paragraph I want to translate. Right. So it's not going to translate any content. The above mentioned content need to be translated. So what is the content that I want to process that is given as the primary content? Supporting content means so some uh, some prompt may contain supporting content, which means it helps the model to understand the instructions very clearly. For example, in my case, I have mentioned, OK, you have to generate 10 react questions. So it will generate 10 questions, no problem. But I have clearly mentioned include the question from these, these, these topics only so that the model is able to generate relevant answer, relevant questions and answers from those uh, topics which I have mentioned. So that is a supporting instruction or supporting content I have provided. I have clearly mentioned generate the question from these mentioned topics. OK, so without that also it will work. Without that also it works, but the accuracy or relevancy will be less. So that's why the supporting content is required. Grounding content is the third one. So grounding content means. I don't want to process. The main content. If you want to process the main content, we can call it as primary content. For example, a paragraph which I have to translate into a different format or a paragraph which I want to summarize. So that means I have to process that paragraph. But here grounding content means I will be providing some 
lengthy information and my questions will be based on that for example i will be giving information a very lengthy paragraph or lengthy text content i am providing about the indian economy and then my questions will be based on that so i'll be asking so uh, tell me which is the uh, uh, or which year india has uh, reached this particular position okay so by looking into that pro provided information it will find the answers from that paragraph so it is not translating that content or it is not uh, summarizing it instead of that whatever questions i am asking it will be finding the answers from that content not from the pre trained memory so usually all the questions are answered from the pre trained memory but this time because i am providing a grounding content i am telling the model do not use your uh, pre trained memory all the questions you have to answer from the content i have given for example i am giving the information about a hospital okay suppose we have Uh, apollo hospital so i am giving the complete history of Ap apollo hospital the different departments the doctors information all informations i have given as a grounding content and then i am asking okay how many branches are there for apollo hospital so then it goes to that content which i have provided and try to find the answer from that or uh, who is or which is the doctor name or what is the doctor name um uh, who works in the ortho department in that particular branch so it goes to that content and go to the specific branch information and find out who is working in that ortho department right so that means it does not use the pre trained memory it will try to find the answers or it will try to generate the answers based on the content which i have provided so that content is called the grounding content okay now we have queues so queues provide a starting point on which the completion builds i have already showed you an example of uh, the the story generation so i have started the story like once upon a time there was a cruel king so it understand okay we need a story of a cruel king but if i am writing a story like uh, if i am writing a sentence like a uh, once upon a time there was a monkey then it will understand okay he is expecting a story of a monkey so depends on the starting point it will understand what to do next okay an example you can see in the right side there are lots of reviews uh, about the movies okay so it's a positive review is there negative review is there everything is there so there are hundreds of reviews there and below i am saying you can see is there is a section marker which divide the reviews and the instruction so in instruction is below i am saying the instruction is summarize the reviews above that is the above is the reviews you need to summarize so yes it will do the summary it will create the summary but that summary will include positive reviews and the negative reviews but i have given a queue there saying most common complaints are then i given a hyphen which means i need the answers in a bulleted point format so most common complaints are which means the model will understand okay he is expecting only about the complaints means negative reviews only he is expecting so you can see below is the generated answer and the hyphen represents a bulleted point right so the movie was too long the special effects were terrible so it's not giving the positive reviews because we are expecting the complaints right so that means so we have given a hint if i am not providing this hint it will just summarize the reviews but instead of just summarizing i have given a hint saying that most common complaints are then providing a hyphen which means hyphen in markdown document means a bulleted point so it uh, generates the uh, summary in a bulleted point format and also it generates only the complaints okay similarly in uh, programmer is, suppose if you are a programmer you can use the code generation tools to generate the code uh, by by just providing the starting point like a sql statement like a select star from the remaining thing it will automatically fill or write a functions 
uh, name, it will write the remaining part of the function. For example, consider I'm giving you an example of code. Just a minute. I just need to authenticate because there is a code generation tool which I have used. It just give me a minute. Okay. Okay, so I have uh, opened the Visual Studio code, and inside that I'm generating a Python file, something like app.py. And inside of this, I'm writing a function like a def and then binary underscore search. So I'm just uh, providing this beginning part of this, like a DEF binary search. Look at that, the remaining portion, it automatically identifies what to generate because from the name, it is able to understand what to do next, right? So from the starting point, it is understanding what, what he is expecting. He is expecting a binary search function. So it will write the code for that, right? So this is an example for Q. So you just need to provide the starting point, the remaining thing, it will automatically identify. So this is the Q's. Requesting output composition. So when you uh, generate the responses, you can clearly mention in which format you are expecting the results. Like here, like a prompt, you can see write a table in Markdown with the six animals in it with their genus and a species. So when you say that I need the answer in a Markdown table format, so it generates a Markdown table format with the six animals in it, that means animals name will come and with their genus and a species. So you can see the genus and the species is coming in the uh, next columns, right? So this way we can specify what kind of output format we are expecting. The next is system message. So what is the importance of including system messages? I have clearly showed this example in the beginning with the chat playground. Suppose if I'm setting the system message uh, as uh, that that the assistant need to work like a teacher, okay, then it is uh, generating the instruction, the generating the completion answers just in a text format. But when I changed the uh, system message to uh, that you are a Python developer who helps developers to write the code. So when I change that, it is generating 
the response with the Python code. So same prompt, but two different kind of answers we saw. It's because of the system message, because in the system message, we can specify what is the nature of the assistant. So you can see here is an example. You are a casual, helpful assistant. You will talk like an American old Western film character. So that is the system message. So that means the, the assistant will be talking like an American old film character. Now the user is asking a question saying, can you direct me to the library? So when he asks this question, usually it has to just as answer like, OK, you can take a right turn and then you will see a building and you, you can go inside like that. Normal answers we can provide, but because it is talking like an American old Western film character, you can see how it is answering it. So answer is same, but the way it is providing that uh, uh, speech is different. You can see, well, how did there stranger the library? Hmm? Right. So you can see that uh, the way how it is uh, expressing or presenting that answer. It's not a normal way of answering the, the the questions, right? So that means we can control the behavior or nature of the assistant by using the system message. Conversation history and few short learning. So conversation history means if the user and the assistant is uh, conversing each other, we can say it's a conversation history and why we have to include that in the prompt. It is. A part of the few short learning, so few short learning is a prompt engineering technique that helps the assistant or the helps model to generate the answers in a particular format or particular way. For example. Consider that we are setting the system message as you are an assistant that evaluate the sentiment of a customer feedback. So we are just saying you are an assistant. Who can evaluate the sentiment of the customer feedback? So don't look at the other text directly. You look at the last one. So after the system message, you can directly look into the last message saying you can't miss this. That's the user review. So the user is giving the review as you can't miss this. So if you see the assistant is evaluating the sentiment. So what can be the response? It will say that, OK, according to the uh, text which is provided, I can understand this is a positive feedback. So because you are. Uh, saying it's a you can't miss this so you can't miss this means what it is a positive review so it will the, the assistant will give you an explanation that okay so i can see that this is a positive review okay like this lengthy explanation it will give but i don't need a lengthy explanation i just need a one word answer whether it is a positive or negative that's it but how i will make the agent or make the assistant aware about that. This is the way you have to answer. So we can give some examples to understand that. So you can see uh, role equal to user and content equal equal to that was an awesome experience. And then we uh, then the assistant is replying. It's positive. That means this is a positive one. And then the second example user and the content is I won't do that again. So that means the assistant is saying it's a negative. Then the third example user content is that was not worth my time and the assistant is saying negative. So from these examples, it is understanding the assistant is answering just a positive, negative or positive or negative like that means it is just giving a one word answer for every review. So from the from these examples, we, which I am including the assistant will be understanding. OK, previously I have answered this way. OK, every time I'm answering just a positive or negative. That's it. So when the next question comes, it also answer in the same way. Because. From the previous 
conversation history, I can understand that I am supposed to answer just in one word, positive or negative. So for the last prompt also, it is giving just a positive or negative only. So that's a benefit of including conversation history for the learning purpose. So we, are, we have included three examples here, right? So first conversation, second and the third. So three examples we have included. So it, we can say it's a example for few short learning. So uh, there can be zero shot. Zero shot means no examples included. For example, I think, uh, yes, here. Here you can see after the system message directly the prompt. There is no examples included, which means this is a zero shot prompt. One shot means if you are including one example, then it is one shot prompt, one shot learning. But here you can see there are three examples we have included. So it's called a few shot learning. And the final point is chain of thought. So in chain of thought, we instruct the model to give the answers in a step-by-step -step format. Instead of giving a, a straightforward answer, tell me how this is generated, how this answer is generated. So you can see an example. We have a prompt saying what sport is easiest to learn but hardest to master. Give a step-by-step -step approach of your thought ending in your answer. So if I'm giving only the first two question, like the, what is a sport easy to uh, learn but hardest to master? So it will simply say cricket, football, or maybe uh, or tennis, something like that. But on what basis it is giving that answer? On what basis you are saying, okay, cricket is easy or tennis is easy? On what basis? So, what do you mean by easy to learn and harder to master? So, give me the step by step explanation. So, why you have selected tennis as the uh, easy to uh, learn, harder to master sport? Tell me the step by step reasons. So, now you can see the answer comes in this way identify the criteria for easy to learn and harder to master sports. Then the for a sport which is considered to be easy to learn, it should have simple rules and require minimal equipment. For a sport that is harder to master, it should require years of practice to perfect and a large variety of techniques and strategies. So the first step is identify what is the criteria, like what is mean by easy to learn and what is mean by harder to master. Now, next step, we are identifying different sports. So consider different sports that fit in this criteria. So tennis, we are considering golf, we are considering football, we are considering cricket, and there are many sports we are considering. And then we are putting this points there, okay, which is giving simple rules, but uh, takes years of practice. So that points we are considering. And then we are coming to a, a evaluation stage where if we will evaluate each sports based on the above mentioned criteria. So second step, we have identified different sports. And then third step, we are taking each sport and then putting into this criteria, evaluating with this criteria. So which is uh, easy to learn and harder to master. So tennis we are considering, football we are considering, golf we are considering. So after considering each and every sport with this criteria, then we'll finally we will come to this conclusion. Okay, based on the above criteria and evaluation, we have come that tennis is the easy to learn and hard to master sport because there is uh, simple rules are there, but takes years of practice to uh, learn it. So that is the conclusion. So instead of giving a simple answer saying tennis or football, it clearly defines how it comes to that conclusion. So this is uh, used mainly for complex reasoning scenarios. Okay, so very complex situations. So we have to understand how it comes to that conclusion. For example, in a stock market investing application. So that if, if the bot is uh, suggesting some sports, we can say, okay, just a minute.
Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, let's continue. So, uh, in 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 case of uh, stock marketing applications, we can understand that uh, uh, when the uh, application says that you can invest on this particular share or particular uh, stock. So, on what basis it is giving this uh, suggestion, or on what basis it is providing such a uh, uh, recommendation? So that. If you want to know, then it has to uh, give the explanation. So on what basis? So based on the previous history or uh, uh, the, the, the uh, yeah, based on the previous history, how it is providing this answer. So that is uh, in that scenarios, we can use this chain of thought uh, prompting method. So that's it in this uh, module. So in this module, we have learned how the different uh, uh, prompt engineering techniques can be considered for uh, prom, uh, creating effective prompts. So, so that's the end of this module. And we will uh, see in the fourth module how we can use the code generation uh, can be done and image generation can be done with uh, the uh, open AI models. So uh, let's take a break here for lunch and then we will continue after that. So I'll be answering your questions uh, once the break is over. So let's take a one hour break and then we will continue after that.
Hello, everyone. All are back. OK, so I hope all are back. Archie, are you there? Can everyone raise your hands or put a message if you are back? Okay, I can see only one person has responded. Okay. Okay. So let's continue then. We have just uh, finished. Two, uh, sorry, three modules. Now we are moving to the next module. OK, I hope the screen is visible to. All of you. So in this module. We are going to discuss about how to generate. Code with Azure Open AI. Code generation is a feature provided by generative AI applications. Maybe some of you will be using uh, tools like uh, GitHub Copilot or Amazon Code Whisperer or Tab9. So these are some of the code generation tools 
which we can use inside our IDE. So if you are a Python developer, .NET developer, or Java developer, you can use the code generators to make developers' life easy. Means you can build the applications in very less time because the AI enabled the extensions or AI enabled uh, tools can easily generate the code for your applications. So in this module, we are seeing how to construct code using natural language, then complete the code and assist in development and improve the code and fixing the bugs. So if you see the open AI models like uh, GPT 3.5 or GPT 4 are providing the capabilities for code generation. So previously there was a model codex which is specifically designed for uh, code generation and code management. But that feature is now integrated within the GPT models, which means now the GPT models can generate the codes in different languages, means programming languages. It can fix the bug for the within the application. You can optimize your code and even documentations or comments can be added to the code. So how the code generation is happening? If you consider the GitHub Copilot, which is a Microsoft product for code generations, we can integrate the GitHub Copilot within the IDEs like uh, Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio or Eclipse kind of uh, development IDs, we can add the uh, GitHub Copilot as an extension, which can do all the code related functionalities, including code generation, code fixing, optimization, commenting, everything. But how it is generating this code? Because these tools like a GitHub Copilot, they use GPT-based models for code generations. Means even if you are using GitHub Copilot, behind the scene, it is using the GPT model, GPT 3.5 or GPT-4 models. So how these models are able to generate the code because these models are trained with millions of code repositories available in GitHub. So if you see GitHub is a code repository and it is uh, containing different public uh, application code, the Republic repositories. So this co-pilot kind of applications or even GPT as a model is trained with millions of such repositories, code repositories, so that they understand how to generate the code. Suppose if you ask the model to, sorry, you ask the uh, GPT model to write a code for a particular scenario, it will be able to generate that information. It is always a better practice to write the code using artificial intelligence, which because it will help you to reduce your development time. But 
one thing is you have to always review the code because since it is an AI generated code, it may not be 100% accurate or suitable to your environment because suppose you are asking the model to generate a code in .NET 8, but the model may not be trained to develop the code for the latest version. So when you ask the model to generate some code for a particular purpose, it will be generating the code based on the uh, version, old versions, maybe version 6 or version 5. And you try to apply that code directly into the version 8, then there can be some problems, there can be some issues. So you always need to verify whether this code is correct or not, logically correct or not. So that's a duty of the developer, but developer need not to write the complete code. And another important thing is you have to break down the complex operations into simple tasks. So do not write very lengthy and complex operations using AI uh, code assisting tools. Instead, you can split that functionalities into small uh, utility functions and then make a call from the main application or main function. So 